Hello and welcome to our fourth lecture grab and today we're going to be venturing underground. We're going to be looking at caves, cave sediments and the wealth of in, um, data that and things that we can find underground and this is why I've called it treasure underground because really caves are phenomenal for the amount of material and the amount of data that you can actually get for reconstructing um, climates and environments. Okay, now as you can see, I seem to feature in a lot of these photos. Um, I love caving, I think it's fantastic. I only got into caving since I started research because of the amount of evidence and data you can find in caves. Um, so I started abseiling courses and caving courses just so I could um, keep up with all my research aspirations. Okay, so. Let's have a look at caves. Now this is a phenomenal cave. If you can name this cave before I do, you get extra brownie points. <laughs> this is Leon Boer in Flores. And this is actually a bird's eye, um, a fish eye lens. So you can see that the cave is huge, um, curved, actually two caves that are amalgamated into one. Uh, but you can see incredibly well decorated and really amazing cave to work in. And this is, if you don't know, this is where they found New, we found, sorry, new species of um, human Homo floresiensis just over in this corner over here. Okay, now caves are um, underground or exposed chambers, usually found in limestone areas, which we call cast, uh, but you can also find marble caves. So marble is metamorphosized limestone. Um, sandstone caves as well, but they're more kind of like rock shelters. And you can also get lava tubes, which we also call caves as well. But we're gonna be looking at the limestone version, okay? Now, when they're formed, they're formed either below the water table, which is called in what's called the phreatic zone, and this is formed by solution. So, do you remember how it, and when we're talking about speleothems, we're talking about, you know, rainwater and um, carbon from the, the the soil combines to form a weak carbonic acid, and this dissolves limestone. Now, we talked about how that then re-precipitates back into uh, into calcite, but if this dissolving continues, starts off with a tiny little crack in the limestone and it can build into a massive, massive chamber. So this is what we call dissolution, okay? Um, and this is in the phreatic zone, but also caves can also develop when they're in the what's called the vidose zone, and that's above the water table. And when you're there, it's usually dominated by fluvial activity. So the whole the whole role of a cave really is to channel water from the top of a limestone environment down to the water table. Okay, so the line, the, the caves are just there to channel um, the water down. Okay, um, but as they channel them down, they tend to store things, and it's the storing bit that's really, really interesting. Okay, the sources of the sediment are from inside the cave, so you get cave breccias and um, cave earths and things like that, and also outside of the cave. So you've got slope wash from around the landscape washing in things like tephras, um, fossils, stone tools, anything that's on the landscape can get washed into the cave and then stored inside the cave. Um, lots of different types of sediment, mostly clastic detritus sediment. We also get organic sediment. We get things like uh, bat guano and, um, and also um, obviously fossils. Um, and then we get the precipitated carbonates, which is the calcites as well. Loads of fossils, like this is what's so incredible about caves, is the preservation of fossils. Animal, animal, animal and human bone um, can be found. And this is sometimes found in an occupation cave, um, like Liambua here. These are zones of occupation where we know they were actually living. But we also get what's called pitfall traps. And sometimes you get little solution um, holes at the top of the caves here and the little animals walking along and it drops and falls straight in and then accumulates bones like that. So there are two different types of caves. Um, we get speleothems, so stalactites, if you haven't worked it out yet, stalactites come down and stalagmites, so in this cave here, there's stalagmites here, um, grow upwards. So one drips to the other um, and then we get flowstones. Now, in this picture here, the flowstones are these things down the side. And what's happening is the water has run down the side of the cave and then forms flowstones over the top of the sediments right there. Okay, and these could be used for dating and paleoclimate. And we also get cave art. Now, obviously not cave art in this cave, um, but especially like the rock shelters in um, Australia, some amazing um, cave art that we can find there. So, 
cave forming, I've already really talked about this, but basically we have depressions in the top of the limestone here, um, and these are um, called what we call dolins. And the rainwater there is combining to form this weak carbonic acid, and it's coming down here um, and forming, forming these shafts. So under the water table here, there's the water table here. Under the water table, remember, is phoratic. Above the water table is for dose, um, and forms all these incredible, intricate um, passageways, massive domes. So we get big domed chambers and also tiny little solution um, uh, passageways as well. So on this picture here, you'll notice this because this actually appears um, in one of the quizzes and we have phoratic and the dose shown, zones shown here. And I'm not going to tell you which is which um, because it's actually one of the quizzes. Um, but up here, you can see a really nice dolin. Um, and sometimes you have a river that suddenly just drops away into nothing. OK, um, and this is basically a solution hole here and the river is going back down and then down to the water table. So on a limestone landscape, on a cast landscape, you don't really get much water on the top of the landscape. You don't get much water in the rivers. Um, you don't get big lakes or anything like that. And people are thinking, oh, well, it must be really dry. It's not dry. It's just that the water is all actually under underground. OK, um, down the bottom here, you can see um, nice shapes. So here's a lovely phoratic shape here to show that the cave was formed underground. This is a Vidos shape. You can see here it was phoratic in its initial formation. Um, and then since it's been out of the water table, it's got this Vidos um, drawdown effect down the bottom here. It forms a kind of key sh keyhole shape. And you get these in a lot of caves um, that we see. Now, what's really amazing about caves is the sediments that you find inside the caves. You get unconsolidated sediments, which are caves earths, um, fluvial sediments, volcanic, colluvial, um, lacustrine, everything that you see on the landscape is actually all found um, within the cave. Um, and we also get the consolidated sediments. And this is what we call uh, breccia, where you can see this here is a nice breccia. It's basically got angular um, clasts, like this one here. Um, usually from colluvial sediments, so slope wash and things like that, washing into the cave. And these breccias are usually contain fossils. Um, so because it's everything washed for the landscape, it's like basically sweeping up the landscape and putting it all in the cave. OK, and these are fantastic for finding fossils and uh, and the like. Um, and then also sometimes you get conglomerates. Now, conglomerates obviously usually by its name have more rounded pebbles. You can see this one here, nicely rounded. And these are usually rounded in the river. So this is probably some fluvial um, intrusion here into the cave sediments. Now, caves form natural sediment traps. So they, they're naturally designed to trap sediments. And they're protected from weathering and erosion that you get from terrestrial records. So a lot of terrestrial records on the surface, things like river terraces can be eroded quite easily. These are nicely protected. But the problem with cave sediments is also we have a lot of fluvial action inside. So even though they're protected from above the cave, sometimes they get eroded um, from actually inside the cave themselves. Now, I don't want you to think everything is underground. Um, you get surface cast features. Um, so this is limestone that's been exposed and it forms these kind of needle shapes. And this is basically just rainwater um, dissolving down through the limestone, forming these um, big forests of needles. Um, the, the dolins also, you get lots of dolins, which are these ones here. Um, they start to form these um, cone shaped cast um, mountains. And this is like this one here, these are in Indonesia. Um, and they, they form like incredible landscapes of just co cones and dolins all over the place. So really incredible. And one thing I want to point out is something you're going to see when we go to Kerry's Cave. This is what's um, called Rillin Karen. Now, it looks like a giant has come with big long fingernails and made a big down the rock. But this is actually just rainwater. And this is the effect of rainwater on limestone forming these really nice surface cast features. So when we get to Kerry's Cave, I want you to try and be the first person to find Rill and Karen. So here is the cave um, that we just looked at earlier. I just wanted to show you some more of the features. So again, a stalactite up here, not the best for paleoclimate. We generally don't use stalactites for paleoclimate, uh, mainly because it has a central drip function down the middle here, the central drip hole, which is actually um, a little tube, which we call a soda straw. And then it starts to build up um, 
the calcite around the side. But problem is the drip water that's coming through it is getting re uh, the sorry the the calcite around it is getting re precipitated by this drop of water that's coming through. So it's actually not very good for paleo climate. But if we have a look at this big uh, stalactite here, you can see this is dripping down onto this massive stalagmite here. This is accumulation of lots and lots of different stalagmites all over this whole area. And these stalagmites are much, much better for paleoclimate because once the drip touches the top, it rolls down the side and is out the way so that it's not compromising or re-precipitating that climate signal. Okay, so we can use uh, stalagmites. Again, you can see this is much bigger now, so you can much easier see all this flowstone. This is all flowstone on the side of the wall. All the way around here is all flowstone. Um, and around, I can't get the mouse to move, but I, <laughs> all around here is also flowstone as well. Okay, now let me see if I can find some draperies. Um, down the side here, can you see how it's got this lovely curved thing? This is what we call a drapery. You're going to see loads of those at Carey's Cave as well. Again, not great for paleo climate, but really nice um, features. Um, now, you can see on some of these features here, you can see how it's kind of going out at a funny angle. Okay. Now, this is mainly because the cave initially formed and at the back, all the stalagmites at the back are incredibly straight. Okay. Showing that they were formed when the cave was still an underground chamber. But since the cave has been exposed, and we've worked out that's probably around 100,000 years ago, you can see that the stalagmites are starting to lean this way, and they're leaning towards the light, okay? Because the light's coming in here, and they're leaning towards the light. Because sometimes you get these, cyan uh, these bacteria inside the, the stalagmite that encourage the precipitation to actually go towards the light. So they're kind of leaning, plus we get evaporation, so they're kind of going off in funny angles, okay? So you're, again, you're gonna see a lot of those features at Kerry's Cave because there is through draft of air um, throughout that, that chamber. And here's an, this is um, actually Narracourt Caves in um, close to Adelaide um, in Southern Australia. And you can see, again, beautiful stalagmites. Look at the size of these stalagmites. Now, when a stalagmite joins with a stalactite, it forms a column. And this is actually a column here. So it's a complete column um, of calcite. So really amazing beautiful features here. Now this is cave sediments. These are from cave sediments from Liambua. Now I've put these in because I just want to show you how complicated cave sediments can be. Um, we've got something that looks very strange here. Can you see the angle at which this sediment has been deposited? So this is um, a cave wall, a, a bulk of an excavation here. Um, and you can see it's kind of like that. Now when I draw a line around it, it's kind of making a what shape? Yep, it's kind of making a V shape a V shape like this and a V shape always indicates a channel. So this actually was a pond at one point and these are all tephra sediments and they've accumulated inside here. But hang on a minute, what's this very strange thing going down here, here and here? Now when you're looking at sediments and you see a vertical um, connection between one side of the sediment and the other side here, that should ring alarm bells straight away. This vertical um, connection between the two indicates something has happened. And what's actually happened is erosion, okay? Now, this sediment here used to go all the way around here, and so did this sediment here, okay? Now, something has come along here, probably a channel, and eroded all the way down here, all the way, if my mouse will do, all the way down here to here. And it's eroded all of those original sediments, and now it's deposited all these younger sediments. And you can see the channel has even followed later on here to form this deposit here. So vertical um, associations between sediments, always look out for those because they always mean some erosion has happened. So it, this sediment here is much younger than these sediments over here. These are the older original sediments. These are the younger sediments, okay? If I can get my mouse to work, it's being very silly. And here's also Liambua. This is the sediment that you just saw in the other picture. This is tephra sediments. Um, and you can see here the lower bedding contact. So this is the contact between this sediment here and this one here is very, very sharp. And that usually means erosion. OK, so there has been erosion and then this whiter tephra has been deposited afterwards. OK, so look out for 
um, vertical contacts and lower bedding contacts that are really sharp because they usually mean um, erosion of some short sort. Um, and that's it from our treasures from the deep. Oh, no, it's not. I do lie. Sorry. <laughs> so this is just showing you some of the things you can find within the cave. These are stone tools. And look how many stone tools there are. Look how some of these, how sharp some of these are. Sometimes when the excavators were digging, they were actually cutting their fingers on how sharp the stone tools were. And these were buried like 20,000 years ago. So that's incredible to me. But what you can see here stone tools. Um, you can also see um, over here, sorry, there's some bone. So all mixed together in what we call a living floor. And then finally, Australian caves. Now, as I said before, lime, uh, sandstone can form caves, but they're more like rock shelters. And these are incredible um, um, rock art paintings. These are what we call Guion Guion, or the Bradshaws sometimes we call them. And you can see on here, there's something very interesting. This is what this little mud wasp here, he likes to make nests. And if he makes a nest, he picks up quartz grains or grains from the from the uh, river and flies them over and makes a nest on top. Now, the question to you is, if I date this, this mud wasp nest, the age that I get, will that be older or younger than the rock art below? Okay, is it a minimum or a maximum age? I'm gonna leave that question with you and say goodbye.